Mark is also um, a professor. <clears throat> He's teaching uh, structural design at the University of Applied Science in Rhein-Main. And he has also previously taught at the Städtle Schule in, in Frankfurt. Uh, when we started talking about, Mark and I started talking about doing a workshop here at SIAC, uh, we really discussed the role that structure can play in design. Uh, and rather than it being an afterthought, like it often is, you have a design and you're trying to figure out how to hold it up. Uh, the idea was much more to integrate it this time and have it part of a, of a studio. And so <clears throat> what, uh, what was going on here, and the people who are in the workshop obviously know, but for, for, the, for the rest of the SIA community, we, we tried to bring in um, uh, these guys at midterm or right after midterm for 2GA and uh, working with the design faculty, um, Devin, Jenny, Russell, and Christy. Um, uh, on, on the design basically at the point where there is a project already there but it's not really resolved yet and it still needs to gel. You know, I think this, this is a really uh, interesting experiment. Hopefully we can continue that. So um, uh, these guys have been working in Caramba, which is a structural software also that um, was developed by Bollinger Gronemann and keeps on being developed. And I think it's really interesting software for SIAC students to use. It's, it is somewhat intuitive. I would say, which is the great thing. It's some of the software for architects, not just for engineers. And um, so, you know, often this kind of like very symbiotic relationship between uh, architect, and I talked a little bit about this in the workshop, between architect and structure is a really a unique kind of relationship, uh, uh, which means the, the structure engineers are often very much involved in the kind of aesthetics you guys are developing uh, with your design. So it's, it's, a, it's one of those professions that are not um, really coming after everything is done, but somebody you're working with uh, um, together um, through a design process. So anyway, um, we're excited to have Mark and his team here. We hope he will come back soon again for another workshop. And without further ado, Mark Falbusch. <clears throat> Thank you very much for the introduction. Well, um, it's a great pleasure to be here and to, well, talk to you and to do the workshop. We really very much enjoy doing the workshop, working together with you, just starting from the midterm, because now you, well, the students really have a project and we can work on it hands-on. I really very much like that. Since you are not very often probably in European projects, so you don't see so many and you don't know what we are doing, I will show you some projects we did in the past, the bigger projects, and then we, I will show you projects with, well, more grasshopper in there, and then I will show you projects with caramba in there. So you see the levels, what is developed, how, and you will, well, you will see that this grasshopper is getting more and more into the projects. Just, well, it's, it's getting a standard tool for very many projects. So I would like to start. Here's just a rough overview of our projects. I will just immediately jump into well, a little bit historic project. That's, well, our first complex uh, project with Coop Himmelblau Architects. It's the uh, cinema complex in Dresden. And this is important. That's why I show it. It's, uh, well, it's complex and uh, 3D, and then we early on started to develop things in 3D. The same thing with the Kunsthaus Graz with Peter Cook, architect. And well, those days, this one was still a physical model. We received a physical model and uh, Peter Cook shaped it in many ways. And then, then we did a 3D scan of it and then we continued on. And these days it turned around, we first make a 3D model and then we do a physical model. So that's why I always like to show that project. But with these, Two projects mainly, we got into, well, people knowing us for doing complicated things. And, well, complicated, you could call it challenging too. And that led to a series of very interesting projects. Another Coop Himmelblau project, the BMW world, a cloud flying held by a double cylinder. And here you see the structural model. We were trying to have almost no structural things underneath this cloud. Well, there was some kind of a core we had to do, but 
If you're inside this building, you hardly see that there's some structure, it's all empty underneath. So here you can somehow still see the, the, the cloud. And well, we always have the issue with the glass, the, the lie that the glass is transparent, but it, it's still flying. The double uh, cylinder, and here you see, well, how the cloud is looking. The cloud is shaped in a way that where we need lots of structure, we have a very thick cloud, and where we need no structure, we have a thin cloud. And that's basically the way you can, where, well, you can interact act with your structure in the design process. And this is what we are right now doing in the workshop, that, well, you can shape this in a way that structure and architecture fit well together. If you finish your complete project, till the end and then you put the structure underneath, maybe the cloud has a very thin place right here where it should have been thick. The next project I want to show you is the ZANA EPFL Rolex Learning Center. It's like a Swiss cheese. And well, it was a very long discussion. Well, should that be a shell structure? Should that be on columns? Or how should that structurally be built. Zana had the idea that it was floating above the ground, but it had to be walkable. And as you probably know, if you look at arches, that uh, they are always shaped like that and nobody can walk on them. And here we had the challenge to make mostly the flattest arch possible. And we always, well, calculated, checked, calculated, checked, because we didn't want the arch to buckle away and we wanted to have it even walkable. Therefore, we had to pre-stress all the ground so that the arch doesn't go a little bit further out and falls down. And we had, well, we thought of putting columns underneath. The contractor wanted columns, but we said, if you put columns, then you will just break the arch because then it will be pinned up on the column. So here you see the main problem. And so you don't want the arch to fall down. And basically, we have to really make sure that the feet are not further going apart and that the shell is stiff enough not to do this shape. So we defined or we looked where we have real integer arch-like structures. And this is what I was in the lecture before. You have to look where is the load-bearing behavior in your structure, and then you can define them, and then you can make them stronger or weaker, but you have to understand what's happening in your structure. And therefore, the caramba is very nice because with the first glance, you look at it and you see something is wrong, and you can understand what to do, especially if you have not so much practice in doing structures. Now, a little bit pictures of the, the whole thing. We did all the foam work with wood. We had to do all foam work drawings in Rhino because, well, regular software didn't work. And then you had this very nicely finished foam work. Later on you will see that the underneath, the concrete flush was very beautiful. As I said, you, we had to stabilize the foot points of the arch very strongly so that the arch didn't fall down. Here you see the reinforcement. It's a little bit thicker than outside here. The finished, and well, for us, we build quite a lot in Europe with concrete, and there's always a discussion, visible concrete or not visible concrete. This is basically a non-visible concrete from the definition, but the quality turned out to be that good that it's almost like a visible concrete. Here you see the flat part, which was wiggling before, the arch and the finished project. Well, another project which I cannot come around telling you about is the Busan Cinema Center with Kop Himmelblau. The Busan Cinema Center was a competition we did with Kop Himmelblau, and we thought, well, we do a big cantilever, and then in the end, well, it will look different. But then the mayor of the city said, ah, we, I want the biggest cantilever of the world. And so we were stuck to this big, <laughs> the biggest cantilever of the world with 85 meters span. And, well, 
it has to withstand typhoons, it has to withstand earthquake, so it's the full program. There is some additional, well, poles which could come out if necessary, but, well, they're basically not necessary for the calculation issue. Here you see a steel grid. We made a rectangular pattern and then we made the steel structure, so this can be a solution for such an irregular shape as we have seen in, with a cloud in the BMW world too. You see the deflections. Finished project. And big thing was for sure the lifting up of the whole structure. The finished the hole in the roof there is it's full with LED structure, so you can always light it in every color. That's the Korean way of making things very beautiful. Now Zana project. The Louvre Nance, it, this doesn't really fit to our geometry and complexity thing. It fits to complexity, but not to geometry. The nice thing about this project is that, well, people come to us and say there's no structure in there, and that's very beautiful. Because for sure there's structure, but Zana's aim was to make no structure vis visible. And it should fade away into the green, if you look here, so you see it's the same color of the sky, so you, the building should not be really visible. This is the structure of the roofs there. So we had to build almost invisible structure. Now you see it from the side, but if you look from underneath, it's very flat and slender. It's as slender as possible. So you, if you look from the inside, you only see the sharp edge of the structure and you have these mirroring effects on the wall so you always don't know where you really are. Is the room bigger or smaller? The same thing on the outside. You see one panel there's always still the it's still covered and this panel it's open and then you see the sky just fading into the whole building and that's the final project. You see that the intent was, well, I think we made it somehow. So there we did this, the structural design and the facade design in our office. Another project I want to show to you is a Dominique Perrault project. <clears throat> so you see we have buildings which are flat and big, floating buildings, and then there are sometimes towers. And for all the projects, you really have always this challenging part where you have to get the architectural intent and switch that to a structure. And you'll later see in the presentation that, well, the more you can grab onto the structural part, the more you can influence it. Otherwise, you're just, well, well, you're, you're well, you can hope that your structural under, uh, engineer understands what you want, but you have no control of it. And if you use, well, things like Caramba, then you already have an understanding of what is going on and can control the process. This is a very, very slender tower we did with Dominique Perrault. And the idea was that you have two towers standing aside from another, and they're looking at each other and you have these as if they are broken apart so you can put them together. We hope that the second tower will come soon. Now only the first tower, the higher tower is already built. Here you see the second tower and this very, very slender tower. We had to think of how do we stabilize this tower only with the core or with outriggers. If you have very high high-rise buildings you have usually outrigger buildings, outriggers. Usually with this 220 meters you don't need that because your buildings are thicker, but in this case you really needed some outriggers to stabilize the structure. We even thought of steel columns at the outside which are much more expensive than concrete columns. But then playing with the outriggers we finally managed to have concrete even on the outside. It has a damper 
The damper is filled with water, additional to the steel, so you, we could reduce the sway at the top. Here's some images. The floor plates sticking out, and well, ideally we wouldn't have these diagonals here, but they're just sticking out too far, and then you have to somehow compromise between architecture and structure, somehow, sometimes to stabilize the thing, the final tower. Now this is a quite old project. We did that in 2002, that's the Stazione Metro Neapolitana, again, Dominique Perrault. We did this, oh sorry, it was 2005. We did this competition with him, and he came to us and said, I, I want something like, well, roof, shadow, shadow roof, but no, roof, no, only shadow. Tree, no, maybe not tree, some structure. And well, with that in hand, we, we went to our office and tried to find out, well, what is this going to look like? And we thought, well, maybe we can wrinkle something, and if we wrinkle it, then we might find out that it somehow can be stabilized. So we started, you see that here, to wrinkle a grid. And we started to wrinkle the grid vertically, then we still had no support. So we pulled down some points. And now, well, wrinkling a paper, pulling down a support, still makes no structure. It's just, well, something, and maybe it holds, maybe it doesn't hold. So we had to find a process how the structure could hold. So we made an iterative process where we definitely wrinkled the thing and just checked the deflections of the edges. Well, doing that by hand is, well, too much work, so we started in, in Rhino, a process where we built up families and then we started an evolutionary process and with each evolutionary process where we then crossed the better ones, we got to always better deflections or less deflections. So here at the beginning we had huge deflections and at the end we had very small deflections. So we had an irregular structure, it was structurally working, but, well, we did that, and then Dominique Poirot said, but I, I want the control, I want it to look like that. And basically, this is one of the, the points why this caramba thing and the grasshopper thing is so important for you, because you, if you want to have the control over the process, you have to get into the process. I was then sitting there with Dominique Perrault and he was explaining me how his tree should look like and then I went home and started to build trees. And, well, even if I have some experience building structures, a tree like that is not perfect. You build the tree and you find out, well, you have some forces, the forces go down here and this would fall down. And I went back and asked, maybe could you please, may I have a cable here to fix that, to hold that? He said, no. Okay, then I have a deflection issue, or I just make it thicker and thicker and thicker. The ones that we use Caramba now have seen that. The columns got huge on one point, on some points. So then you have to start thinking, how can I, well, really interact with my structure? So I just turned around the force, pulled on the whole thing, and then the change geometry I put in, again, into the calculator, and if you look at this, the force goes down here. This point would move upwards, but this force is pushing, pushing it downward, and the point is stable. The same thing here. This one pushes it inward. This one pushes it outward, and then the whole roof is stable. So we found four trees, put it together, and then it's an Italian project. It took, well, maybe eight years. <laughs> 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 till it got to construction site. And now finally, as it is a 2005 project, it's done, I think last year it was finished. 
So this was the beginning where we started with this, well, we do evolutionary process, trying to find solution, not just by the first approach, if the, it doesn't work, we make the beam thicker, but to find ways in, uh, for irregular structures. Here, the European Central Bank with Kop Himmelblau again. These are two very slender towers and this Großmarkthalle, a huge building from the early 19th century. <clears throat> and we had to do a full refurbishment of that old building and we had to design these two towers. This is kind of a twist, a uh, dancing pair standing close to, you know, uh, to each other, but they're both too slender to stand upright. So as I told you before about this Vienna tower, we had very slender towers, and for a tower always the core gives the stiffness. And if you look at this, it's very slender. This one is very slender. So we had to find something that interacts between the towers and stabilizes both of them. You, already, you see already the solution. And here you see what we did. We built very idealized the structure and put in diagonals in different ways to find out which is the right thing. And if you think back to the Neapel project, this is put in things or changing things randomly and then finding out the best solution. So you're at the picture at the top, you see we put things in, and that's the same evolutionary process we used before. By evolutionary process, we found the ideal geometry. Here you see different steps in the geometry. Well, funnily, we thought we found a solution which was too good, so we had to go back a little bit because the forces were so big in the diagonals, we couldn't get them into the concrete anymore. So we had to find a solution which matched the concrete forces and the stiffening. Here you see the uh, frequency modes, the two dancing. And I'm just quickly going to show you how the detailing is. So these bracings come in here and they distribute the forces into the concrete. And which looks nice on the drawing is quite big in steel. And now then this is embedded into the concrete just to distribute the load in the concrete. And this always, well, since you are more and more building in concrete in the States, concrete can only, well, A, a thirtieth of steel. So concrete is much weaker. It's good for fire protection, but you have to really take care that your loads are not too big. So this is the thing embedded into the concrete. It doesn't look very brutal anymore. These are those diagonals, and that's lifting in those diagonals. The final project. Here, the diagonals, and this is during construction. We think, basically, they should have left the interior open so we see still the towers with a glazed facade in front. We often see just glazed area and not through. If the sun is right, then it's still open. The PGE arena in Danzig, Gdansk, it's in English, with RKW. It was supposed to look like a ship. It's supposed to look like an amber stone. So ship and amber together made this golden thing with stiffeners all around. So here's the ship idea and the amber. And as we had it in the projects before, well, we had the question, what is the right solution? How does this one of the cranes has the right size. A little bit higher, a little bit slow, uh, smaller, a little bit longer. 
And you cannot draw it once, calculate it once, and then you're done. You have to go into a loop and find the right thing. Therefore, we started to make this whole thing parametric and really make it changeable so the whole structure can be arranged so it fits optimal to our needs. Here you see all of them copied around the circle. And then we made it that it can be smaller, bigger. Here you see the grasshopper file to it. And we can arrange the diagonals and all the things. And that's basically if you want to work with free forms, you always decide, well, maybe I want it a little bit different or well, a little bit higher, a little bit lower, and so on. And if you make it parametric, you can, you're open to those decisions. If you're not par working parametric, then you have to redraw everything, and that makes life much harder. The steel construction afterwards, and the final building. So going on in those parametric studies, a client came to us and said he wanted a special bridge between a big parking right at the airport in Frankfurt. Well, this is, this is the square building, this is the parking, and there should have been a bridge or was a bridge needed. And he said to us, well, make some special design for that. So we came up, well, maybe we put up a very, well, a truss with very, a very lattice truss. Or we do something we haven't done yet, we just do an irregular truss. We just put in diagonals, as we did in the European Central Bank, and play with the diagonals till the structure works. Doing some, something like that manually is very difficult because you always think of the truss and then you always get back to your truss. So the computer helped us very much doing this truss-like thing, but it's no truss. But from the physical understanding, it's still the truss, since you can follow the load path from here to here to here. So you see that the loads go all the way into the support, and it's still like a truss, but it doesn't look like a truss. So you playing with the forces is allowed and gives you some freedom in, in the appearance. So above there, there's a truss. Underneath, there's something that's like a truss. And it works as good as the truss. But playing with that, you, you have to understand the rules. And well, this if you build something and then you reconfigure it and you always need to look at the results. Is it getting better or getting worse? We put the diagonals in a way that you always see lines from above or underneath at which go through. So you have always the appearance that something is going through because there are airplanes flying above, cars underneath. We put that all in Grasshopper and then we did this evolutionary process we did before into the computer and found the right positions of the diagonal. Later on, this pedestrian bridge changed to a little cable car bridge and we had to do some rearranged design, but basically this is the way we wanted it to be calculated. This is still not calculated in Karamba, it's still in in an airstab calculated. And well I always have this picture because well if you design something very, very slender, you always have to make sure you can build it. And you have to think of well that your hand really fits into this box and does the welding. And then you have to think 
It's not your hand, it's the hand of uh, a craftsman. It's probably twice as big. And I wasn't so sure if he would make it, but somehow that's my hand. They managed to weld all the way into the corners. So that's then the knot, and then there are some, they welded it, the box profiles were welded in a factory, and the whole thing was welded together on site. Here's the crane, the 1,000 ton crane lifting the bridge. And I think it still looks quite thin. And here you see this little cable car running on the thing. And the airplanes flying above because of the diagonals which are above. We had this discussion in our class last week about, well, how many openings are, can we have in a concrete wall? And we have this project in Al Ain with Shalabi Architects, which is uh, spiraling up, and there's a museum space in there. And you see these little windows, and the question was, how many windows can we have? How, where can they be? How long will the structure still hold if there are windows inside? So we made a study. Here you see the auditorium at the bottom and then this thing spiraling up. Then we made a study, how many windows, where can we do them? You see, that's the Bezo algorithm. It just eats away everything which is not necessary. And this is still a concrete wall. So if I'm talking to you with, about a concrete wall, this is still something like that. So you don't be afraid that concrete wall is not closed like this. It can be very open. So it has been calculated, and that's the way it looks with this grid. And then we had to do the reinforcement drawings, and they were done in Rhino because of the geometry. Always, if it's getting too difficult for the geometry, then you, the standard tools don't work anymore, and then you, you're really close to Rhino again. The window frames, and that's the completed project. So now, we're getting closer to why we're here, to Caramba. As I've shown that usually we have the Rhino, and then we copy it over to, to mostly Erstab, but it could be sub 2000, it could be whatever. But then you have the thing, you copy it over, and then you have to calculate it, and then you have to get it back. And, well, this process is, well, we do that quite often, so we're used to that. But if you don't have to copy it over, it makes things easier and easier for the architect to control. So now we have the plugin Caramba, which really works within Rhino. And then you have the process that you have, um, excuse me. You have the input files, then you make beams or shells or whatever, and then you get the result. Then you have to define the structural issues like supports, loads, cross sections. But basically, this is your thing what you always create, your Rhino file. And the rest can stay more or less the same. So you have to take care of this, and the rest can always be used, reused, and recycled. So that's what we just do in the workshop. One of the projects we did this way was the Zuma uh, White Noise Pavilion something very chaotic. And, well, how does this structurally work? Well, if you just stick two sticks together and then you have a chain of sticks and then they will just hang like a, a cord, so you have to somehow block the sticks at least. If you block it here and block it here, then it cannot work anymore. And then if you have the next one blocking here, oh, it's getting difficult. If, <laughs> if you block it like this, then you can pull against and then get something like a beam. You always have to have 
the three points fixed, and then the whole thing stabilizes. But, well, to find the right three points is always difficult, and, well, it should look chaotic, but it cannot be chaotic because it has to be working. So we had to find the right way how to put the things together, and then we had the generic uh, evolutionary process again, and we said we always want the angles to be changing within a certain range. The grasshopper and the caramba file. And then we played around, or we let the computer play around, to find the right angles to make, you see it's coming closer to the side, it's getting a little bit smaller deflection, but it's not finding the solution. Oh, it's getting better now. So that's the evolutionary jump. And it's really getting closer to the final solution. So we found out that if we have a sinus-like curve between the angles of the different members, they were connecting in a nice way, so they stabilized each other well, perfectly. I don't know if it's perfectly the right word, but, well, accordingly. <laughs> Well, the next thing was how to build that, just to have these beams sticking together. And then you always, when you put one thing to the other, you have to think about the next one because the screws are being blocked. And we ha even had to stick those tubes through the elements to hold each other tight. Here you see the structure putting put together. And here you see always the wells. the thing going from here all the way to there, holding the parts together. That's the way it looks. From the inside, it has a very nice textile. And then, not in Salzburg anymore, in the Alps. This is a Delugan Meisel project for Hyundai in Korea. And this is the first bigger project we completely calculated in Caramba. And this is then the step, not well, this white noise is still a little bit playing with Caramba, and now it's getting slower serious. You see, we had this too in this project, these bundle columns. So sometimes when you're afraid that you don't want to have huge columns, you can say, I have bundles, then it's that's just another solution, then they get thinner, or you spread them out. Thin spread out columns are sometimes better than thick, clumsy ones. And here you see, as your results are in Caramba, that the whole structure is modeled. And this is for you as well very practical because you always can check, is your beam sticking out into your floor plate? Is your beam sticking out? out of your wall or whatever, you have always have the control of, well, ge ge the geometry. That's the final geometry and right. The nice thing is if you model it in Rhino, if you grasshopper it, if you caramba, made it in caramba, then you can make the steel plants from Rhino. You have all one in one process. So that's the final structure. Well, talking about these caramba grasshopper things, the thing is, can you use that in a regular building? And well, we had a client in in Batuts, and he well, he wanted not a regular building, but a regular building. It's still stacked, and he said, well, he had the rules that in the circles here, columns are allowed but they're not always above each other. And then the question is, well, as you have floor plates jumping around in many projects and you have to tra transfer the load down, we thought, is there a possibility, well, just to have columns leaning, but if the columns are leaning, then the whole structure might fall over. So how to stabilize it anyway? We came up with the idea, maybe we use Vs. 
or A's, and we stack them in a way that the whole thing stabilizes itself. Again, the question, what is the right solution? Stack them like in one direction, or stack them, maybe turn the V around, or make an A, or you have so many options, you use, well, you can use your computer to solve that. So those are the V's and the A's. And then we define the areas where the columns are allowed and let the computer place them in a way that they stabilize the whole structure. So even if you build a regular building, it can happen that you, well, some more than a standard intelligence is needed to find the right solution. So playing around, and there you see the deflections here. And you see that with turning and twisting and rotating and moving the V's and the A's, you'll find a solution which is much better than the first one. So basically, it's not so bad if you play around with your, your design to find the right way. So the column's installed, it's rotating, and that's the way the building shall look in the end. Something completely different now. This is not originally not a, a Caramba file, but we then checked it. The ESO, Eastern, well, for the Eastern Hemisphere sky, the, the E is Eastern and European organization. And they wanted to build a building comparable to a supernova. So here you have an image of a supernova just exploding. And, well, this is when a star explodes. How do you build a building which looks like an exploding star? And, well, I, I'm usually against just taking such image literally. So if you build a, a store where you buy cars, it shouldn't look like a car. But anyway, in this case, it looked like a supernova. And that's Bernhardt and Partner Architects. So you, we have these two elements sitting beside each other, and it shall be a museum. And so you go in here, and you have these curved surfaces around. And well, if you look around LA, you always see these curved surfaces. And they have a steel structure behind. And we started out to have a steel structure behind those surfaces, and f but found out that it's easier to fix all the cladding to a surface, surface which has right the same curvature. So you just have to fix orthogonal, and that made the whole idea, the whole thing, cheaper than build to build it in steel. The architect designed the whole building parametrically. So he was able to add a, a stair to the auditorium and the size of the building changed. So this was really completely parametric, but in the end we anyway had to freeze it because if you, you cannot, in the final design you cannot take a chair out and nothing fits anymore. Because it was completely done parametrically. But for us it was a great chance because then we could connect to the parametric design. So this is only one shell structure definition in Grasshopper. Just a little bit about the project, the shells you have seen from the outside. And then you see the museum, and the museum spirals around the whole building and spirals up. So you have a long walk through the museum around the building, which is very good for, so you have a clear walk around the building. And don't have signs 
where to go. But you see already, these are quite cantilevering concrete elements held by the shell structures. For sure, it was calculated. And you see down here, there's a window. And the whole shell has to be load-bearing. Oops, excuse me. And then, well, we did some analysis of all the geometry, because then we had to do the foam work drawings and the reinforcement drawings out of that. And then we did our parametric design to that. So the whole thing is a huge, huge parametric thing. But then out of the shell, we got the, the plans. And the plans had all the information of radia, height, depth, and so on, directly out of the process parametrically. So you could really click and have another plan. This, for complex buildings, the effort of doing that parametrically, well, pays out, because otherwise you would have to do that manually, and then something changes, and you do all, all over again. So those are the plans. And this is the construction side. You see, as in the EPFL project, with these curved surfaces, you get a bit concrete quality, which is basically too nice to, to clad. So I really think, well, it's <laughs> they should have left it like that. But it will be clad from the inside and from the outside. Here you see a bubble deck, we call that. If your slab spans too far and it gets thicker and thicker, then you have more concrete. If you have more concrete, you have to make it thicker because it's, it's heavier. And then you get into a loop. And to get out of that, you can place these bubbles into your slab. And the slab gets lighter. And then you can have span widths up to 16 meters, um, which is 48 feet. So some images. And here you see that you can look through between the shells up to the sky. It's really a little bit of shame to collect all this. So now I'm coming to the end. A recent project is now a design project. We have this area in Frankfurt, right behind the opera, which is, well, uh, one of the best areas in, in Frankfurt for rent. But the owners of this building had problems renting out this building, because it's very deep and dark. And this way between those two buildings was not very nice. So it's called the wave. And the owner asked Schneider Schumacher, architects, well, could you please, please help us? And they asked us, can you maybe help Schneider Schumacher? And Michael Schumacher came up with the idea, well, it's called the wave. We put something wavy in there. And something wavy, and it looks shall look like, shall look like that, maybe, or different. And then we are in the midst of the design process, engineer, architect, well, you have something that shall look like that, but you don't know if it, it holds up. And you have, well, 50 to 200 versions of it looking better or worse. And you have to always program it to, well, to work and to look good. So that's ideal, ideal for the parametric process. So finally, we decided to have this kind of thing. Everything underneath the white line uh, in white is cut off. Everything in red above is, is visual and built. We focused on a shape which is then folded inwards, folded outwards, or has a diamond shape. So we can always play with that. And then we twist the whole thing. Then we have the input, the decided design. Then we have the caramba. And we just 
always changed the geometry and said, okay, it works or it works not, and we could really have an immediate feedback on the whole structure. Just the buckling, we had to take care in standard software of the panels. For the buckling, we then had to think about, well, what happens if we weld some stiffness to our outer skin? If we weld some stiffness to the outer skin, you see the weld, this, this, the weld is hot and then cold, cools off and then it pulls in the steel and you don't want to have the outer appearance like that. You want a smooth core surface. So we said we are not going to have stiffness. We only weld pins to the outer skin. Then you have a point where you have a mistake. You stick the pin through and then cut it off and sand it till it's flat. And that's the way we managed to have no bending like that in the structure. The structure is in aluminum, not in steel, because aluminum you can cut with a hand saw. You can, you can easily, well, it's like, it's like working with wood. Here you see the pins. And here you see the challenge of twisting the plates. They have to be twisted for the whole thing. And aluminum is softer than steel, so you can twist it easier. And for the twist, we used a machine with rolls which are not parallel. And if they are not parallel, then you get a twist in the plate. Usually, that's a mistake in your rolls. But here, you can use it to have twisted plates. And then you can create twisted surfaces. And this way, you can get, well, 3D surfaces out of it. So that's one element out of it. The main arch and the sitting area, the glorious arch. And I already told to the group who's doing the workshop, the, the kids are sitting around those build parts. And then I asked them, maybe, uh, can you climb on them? And then they just told me, well, you have to take the shoes off. So it's just a toy for the kids, or I, I don't know how that the security people don't care, but well, I like it if they can climb up and slide down and do whatever. They don't climb up this one. <laughs> what we do right now in our workshop is, I don't know if everybody knows what this class does. It's a 15-story building in San Francisco. And well, we are trying or we are embedding a structure into the design. And this is just an example. So if you have a line, architectural line model, you plug it into, you have your line model, you plug it into Grasshopper and Caramba, and then it simply calculates, and you have the result you have on the right side. So you get immediate feedback of how your structure works. Here you plug it in into the thing. About the rest, you really don't have to care too much. And then you see, is your building working or not? Thank you very much. <laughs>